Jesus name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to preach for a little for a little while tonight on Christ loved the church. Is the title of the message tonight. Christ loved the church. At the beginning of of this scripture we see the Bible telling the husbands, love your wives. But I want to let everybody rest, especially the men. I am not going to preach on husbands loving their wives. But it's in the, it's in the Word, right? It's in the Bible. It's, you don't, we don't need an interpretation. Us guys, we don't need anybody to interpret. We're supposed to love our wives. And although I'm not preaching on husband loves their wives, I can say that a lot of the problems in the world, 99% of the problems in the world today, how many of you understand there's a lot of problems in the world? It's falling apart. All the systems are falling apart. And and, and we want to blame this person and we want to blame the other person. Is the governor, is the president, is the liberals, is the this and that and the other But sometimes we got to look at the word of God. Where is this thing falling apart? And it is falling apart right there. Husbands, love your wives. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. And when you don't do what the Bible says as husbands, and and so what I'm preaching a little bit right there is that if husbands would love their wives and give their lives for that woman, for those children, for that household, America, the world would be a lot better place. But right now we got men that don't want to shoulder their responsibility. They want to have kids here and kids over there, but they don't want to work. And what? And any anybody that analyzes humanity right now, they can tell you that this is what's falling apart, especially in the poor um, communities where there is no fathers in the house. A mom is having to draw welfare, trying to do whatever she can to to raise the kids. These kids grow up. They don't have anybody to teach them. They don't have a father. They don't have a father figure. And so they ended up up delinquent. They They end up a lot of problems. I heard a message this morning, though. I heard a message this morning. It was just powerful. Pastor Tony was preaching about how we have all these excuses. Adam told the Lord, the woman that you gave me. What was Adam doing? It was He was blaming God. If you hadn't given me this woman, I would have never eaten of that tree. And then the woman says, well, the serpent beguiled me. Just pointing to this excuse and to another excuse. And somebody said, well, maybe if you hadn't planted the tree there, Lord. Why did you plant the tree in the very center of the garden? Adam and Eve had to go past this tree every day. Why? Why, Lord? Why did you put this right in our path? And I began to think, you know, sometimes we hear a message, you get more questions than answers. (laughs) And I began to ask the same question. Well, Lord, why would you put a tree right in the middle of the garden? The Bible says in the center In the middle of the garden, right in the midst of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Lord, why couldn't we just had a tree of life? And Adam and Eve would have never fallen. Has God ever given you a revelation like, duh? The more I thought about it, and listen to me, this might answer every question that you ever had about anything. If you listen to Brother Rios' revelation, not my word is the word of God, but it's taken time for me to understand why God does the way things. And God will show you. If you're hungry, God will show you. If there's something in the word that you do not understand, you can just meditate on the Lord. Meditate on His ways. And God will reveal it to you. And what God told me in prayer this afternoon while I was sitting right here, right before service, we turn the lights out, turn on some music, and all of a sudden we begin to feel the presence of the Lord. If you're not joining us in prayer, man, you're missing it. It is powerful. Even Monday nights right here, 
And then we have fellowship once a month with some good food and good fellowship. The last Monday of this month is going to be spaghetti and salad. Don't nobody leave. I know you're getting hungry. But I began to pray right before service. And it had nothing to do with the message that I'm preaching. It had more to do with the message that I heard Brother Pastor Tony preach this morning. And I don't know if you've ever wondered, why, Lord, did you put temptation there? And then God says, Matt, he calls me Matt. <laughs> I didn't put the tree there to start a fight. The battle that you and I are fighting today did not start at the garden. The battle of good and evil did not start with Adam and Eve. The battle started in heaven when the devil rose up and he said, I'm going to be higher than the most high God. So God is here and he's going to settle the fight that started up there. He said, I'm going to allow there to be a choice. And when it's all said and done, there are going to be people says we choose life. Not everybody's going to choose life. Everybody is going to choose their own way. But I'm telling you here tonight that if you choose life, I want to choose the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. And guess what? I read the back of the book, and we win. <laughs> the battle is ahead of us. Somebody said this world is coming to an end. The world as we know it, it's coming to an end, and it's happening very fast. If you ever thought about backsliding because you want to go out and have some fun, you better go ahead and backslide tonight, okay? Because tomorrow might be too late for you to backslide. And you might not have enough time to have fun. But if you decided you want to make it, you're in the right place tonight. Because Jesus is in the house. The tree of life is in the midst of us here tonight. So although we could preach on husbands love your wives all night, and we can blame one another for all our ills. Anybody here doesn't have any ills? Anybody here don't got any problems? <laughs> but all these problems that we're facing, saints of God, they didn't start when you and your wife got married. It didn't start with your mom and dad. It didn't start with grandma and grandpa. These, these, the, the battle with good and evil has always been raging. But the Bible did tell us that in the last days, everybody say last days. The last days, the devil is going to be like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I feel his presence every day. The other day, I'm laying back there asleep by myself. And, and I don't like sleeping by myself. That's why I got married. And all of a sudden, I don't know if you ever had this happen to you before, my jaw lock up. Woke up and my jaws all locked up. And I've always been taught by mom and dad, when you feel that, just say Jesus. Yeah, and so uh, you're trying to say Jesus, Jesus. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Finally, I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> and usually when my wife's there, she knows I'm having this. I don't know if it's a spiritual battle. I don't know what it is. But usually when I get out of it, I feel like, there's been an evil presence in the room. But I said, Jesus, and I, I went right back. My wife's not there. Nobody's there to protect me. But I just felt such peace. I felt like the Lord was in the house. And I went right back to sleep. That's the kind of God I serve. And that's the kind of God I need. So as we go into this battle with the last days, the devil is everywhere. It's on YouTube. Facebook, uh, television, your radio in your car. And as Pastor Tony was preaching this morning, whatever it is you're feeding yourself, don't be surprised if all kinds of evil comes out of you. So it's time for the saints of God, whatever you're ingesting, it's time to let go of it. Casting off the weights and the sins that so easily beset us and let us run this race. Come on. It's time to get ready. A bride 
a bride, when she gets ready to get married, the wedding is in a couple of days. She begins to iron everything, put all the flowers together, make sure that every, and this is where we're at right now. I hear the voice of somebody crying, behold, the bridegroom, he's on his way. He's on his way. And pastors everywhere, preachers everywhere, telling the churches the same thing. It's amazing that here at this little church with a skinny little old pastor that's 70 years old, God brings you word just like all the other churches. God is bringing us word. Get ready. Iron it out. Fix it. Throw it away. Get ready because the next sound will be, Behold, the bridegroom. I want to be ready. So we're not going to linger on how we as husbands ought to love their wives. But I want to, I want to focus in on the second part. As Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 19. It tells us again. Husbands love your wives. And be not bitter against them. Now. Sometimes it's hard not to be bitter at your wife. And, and the reason us guys. Sometimes can get like. Okay you know what. I ain't never going to talk to you again. <laughs> Not pastor, but all of you. But the reason God is saying this to us husbands is because if he asks that of us and we can do that, then it gives us a, a good perspective of our Heavenly Father. He is not bitter. If he's asking me not to be bitter, somebody said, how's come Brother Freddie is not embarrassed as prayer for his ex-wife? Well, that's okay. You're not bitter. You want God to bless her. You want God to save her. And, and I know we're on YouTube. I shouldn't say stuff like that, but there's a lot of Freddies that don't know what Freddie I'm talking about. Well, we don't need to be bitter. And the reason God puts that on there so that we can know as the bride of Christ that our Heavenly Father, He's not bitter at us. We keep falling and we keep tripping. And, I, and I'm sure God sometimes looks at the church and says, you know what, I'm not talking to you again. He says, oh, no, I, I, you're my church. You're my beloved. I love you. I gave my life for you. I died on the cross that you might live. And He gives us another chance. Every week we fail. Every day we fail. But God is not bitter. He is trying to reach us. The Bible, somebody was giving thanks tonight about a, a church where they tell the truth. In Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, it says, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. A lot of pastors out there don't like doctrine. But here, we love the doctrine. You know why they don't like doctrine? Is because they're the blinds leading the blind. They, they have no idea what the doctrine is. They don't know the ap apostles' doctrine. The apostles never preach one's the Trinity. They never separate a guide into three persons. They declare Jesus Christ to be the Lord and God. Remember Thomas? Until I see the nail prints in his hands, I will not believe. Jesus walks up and he says, Thomas, feel here. Check it out. Thomas falls on his knees and says, My Lord! And my God. <laughs> Doctrine. Jesus is both my Lord. And my God. Jehovah of the Old Testament. Has become my salvation. And so they don't know doctrine. They don't know how to preach. And so they don't know how to teach. And so they're saints. Just sit in the pew. The message this morning. Uh, this afternoon in Spanish was. Don't stay in the same place. For a long time. You need, you need to grow like the plants that we planted out there. They, they need to grow. If, Sister Rios, if we see something not working on them plants, what do we do? What do we do? No, we go to Sister Garcia. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> There's something needs to be done, right? If, if the plant's not... Sister Garcia's got a beautiful, beautiful... I wish I had a picture of it. So you can see how beautiful this plant she planted it, and uh, it, it withered. It withered all the top of it, just all the way to the ground, just nothing but a dead trunk. So she decided, okay, well, that didn't work. 
I'm going to dig it up and I'm going to plant something else. But when she began to dig around that plant, she, she saw a little sprig coming out of that root. And she goes, oh, I think I'll leave it alone. Yeah. Pretty soon a beautiful plant and the most colorful. Yeah. It's about this big, uh, according to the pictures, about, and it goes from red to purples and yellows, oranges. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Saints of God, God wants us to grow. Yeah. And sometimes it seems like there's God is looking at us, come on, boy, get it together. Come on, go to the altar, repent. Right. You done wrong, repent. There's the answer. It's not like blame somebody else, blame mama, blame daddy, blame cousins. No, go to the altar, give it to the Lord. God says, I can take even if it's just a little sprig. If you got a little bit of faith, God can begin to water that and put a little hot sunshine and you can grow up to be a beautiful testimony for the Lord. And you're going to say, look what the Lord has done. Brother Raymar, testimony never gets old. And he don't testify about it a whole lot, but Brother Freddie does. Because Brother Freddie remembers Brother Raymar walking, and there was two of them. They looked alike. But see, this one right here was the, the worst one. Walking a place. Hey, what are you looking at, man? Start a fight right away. He, he could never start a fight that he couldn't finish, though. <laughs> he started, and then he finished it. But now he sits here in the house of God. Why? Because somebody said there is a God that can take your life and make something beautiful. And he stands here as a testimony. And so the Lord here is telling us to Titus, uh, Paul speaking to Titus saying, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Uh, I'm not here to preach prosperity. That's not a sound doctrine. Doctrines are things that God has got in place that you need in order for you to enter into the kingdom, like Sister Garcia was saying, Daddy told me God's not here to make you happy. God's not here to give you a yacht, a Porsche. God is not here to give you a million dollars. If that's what you think God is for, you've got the wrong place. The casino's on the other side of town. But here in this house, we're going to preach doctrine, things concerning the kingdom of God that is going to help us, which is a lot better, Sister, Sister Garcia. It's a lot better than what you were searching for she got to the top and searched, and she got to the top. Is this all there is? Fancy cars, fancy house, uh, fancy friends, and still an emptiness on the inside. A testimony that those things are not doctrinal. Not doctrinal. It's not for the pastors to stand up here and teach you how to get rich. Or give a bunch of money to the offering, and then you will get rich. No, well, that's making me rich. By the way, I don't take the offering here anyway. So we got to speak sound doctrine that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and in charity, in patience. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Is that in the Bible? Whoa, I'm still in the Bible. Not false accusers. Not given too much wine. It's weird that we're not allowed to drink wine, but the women can drink a little bit. <laughs> it teaches us to be sober men be sober but the women not not too much wine <laughs> teachers of good things that they may teach the younger women to be sober yeah. to love their husbands yeah. to love their children to be discreet chaste keepers at home good obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. And you cannot preach this hardly anywhere anymore because what? You're saying the women should stay home? They're the keepers of the house. Keepers at home. That doesn't mean they're supposed to do all the dishes and all the vacuum. And I've preached this many, many times. Husbands, you get the wrong picture if you think your wife is a slave under your... No, your wife is your sidekick, your, your partner. You're working together. There's nothing wrong. I grabbed the vacuum cleaner today and I vacuumed it. Not only did I vacuum this, but I took the vacuum cleaner outside and blew all the, all the stuff out of it. It was all clogged up. Nothing wrong with that. I'm still a man. But I'm a humble man. A humble husband is a good husband. A proudful husband. Hey, woman, give me this. Hey, woman, give me that. That's not like the way God does us. You know, everything that you do unto the Lord, Brother brother Salazar walked up on the campus last night, uh, yesterday or day before, and first thing he taught, he told me, he said, motorcycle sounds good, Pastor. 
I said, well, thank you. He said, what about this grass? You're kind of letting it grow a little bit too much. I said, I'm getting on it, brother. I'm getting on it. But all that we could ever do for the Lord, He does so much more for us. He's not like us, the way we treat our wife sometimes. Give me this and give me that. We ought to be, can I, honey, can I get you something? Can I help you with something? Offering to help. It would be so much better. And again, I told you I wouldn't be preaching about husbands, but an idea of what God is like. And, and we read, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And I want to finish preaching here tonight. Just give me a few minutes. He gave his himself for it. And a lot of times we think that He gave His life for you and I. And we think about the rugged cross, right? They crucified Him. He gave His hands to two rusty nails. His feet to two nails. His side to a, a, a spear. His head to a crown of thorns. He gave His mother to the apostle. Everything He gave at Calvary. His blood and water that came out and purchased us in salvation. But I want to tell you something deeper than just the cross. Obviously, the cross was the finished work because he said it is finished. And he bowed his head, yielded up the ghost. But I want you to understand that that was not all that Jesus gave for you and I. He gave himself. From the day that he was born in a manger, in a stable, long ago, from that moment, all of a sudden the angels in the heavens woke up. And they said, we got to go tell the shepherds. All heaven came un unglued. On earth has been born a Savior. And they came and they bowed before this little baby. From that moment on, his entire life, we see him as a little boy in the temple teaching the, the teachers, the scribes and, and those that studied day and night the, the scriptures. He was in the middle of them as a little boy teaching them. And every day, every day, he had to stay without sin. You and I can make it for a couple hours, right? And then somebody tries us. But every day, walking along the way, Jesus was giving Himself. It had to be the sinless Lamb of God. That's why I love Him so much. Because I have gotten close to Him. I've, I've, I've drawn, remember that song, draw me close to you and never let me go. There are some things that when you look at them from far away, they look, they look flat. You don't see any texture. But when you start getting close, to the item, you begin to see there's different textures to it. And I, I think the devil would like for us to just stay away from God. Jesus is way over there. Uh, you Christians are a bunch of, uh, you, you just like to condemn everybody. You think you're better than everybody else. I've never heard one Christian say I'm better than anybody else. But that's what they accuse us of. So they keep Christ, they keep the church. They keep God far away. And as far as they can see, it's only what the devil would allow them to see. Right. Remember the serpent in the garden? Oh, God knows the day you take. No. God knows the day you take of that is going to happen like he told you. You shall surely die. Right. So instead of listening to the devil and, and the way the devil describes our God, he describes us as a big old mean guy that he's looking for you to fall so he can kick you and, and send you to hell. Oh, but I've gotten close to my God. Somebody said that I can approach. Somebody said that when the veil, when, when, he, when he said it is finished, the veil rent in two and the invitation, come unto me. Come on, boys. Come on, girls. Get close to me and I will give you rest. Come unto me, all you that are weary. Well, all you that labor. And I will. And when I started to get close and I keep, still keep getting closer, and I have found that when I begin to examine my God, you know what, my God, he's not like the devil told me he was. He's not here to send me to hell. 
I think of that woman in that pit. They were getting ready to stone her because she'd been caught in the very act of adultery. I'm sure that as soon as she saw Jesus, I'm dead. Oh, here comes that teacher. He comes that perfect man. She hadn't looked close enough. She's just looking down, ready for the first stone to hit her. But here is the real God. Here is a real Messiah. Not what the devil wants you to think, but the real one walking among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. What? Full of grace and truth. And you shall know the truth, and truth is going to set you free. You're going to get to know Him and, and, and inspect Him. We handled Him as humanoids. We, we handled Jesus. Yeah, we took Him to the cross, but we never were able to forget. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were never able to forget what they saw when they walked close to Jesus. He was healing the lame. He was opening the blinded eyes. He was raising the dead. Our God was full of compassion as He walked on this earth, telling us and showing us what our God is like. If you look close to Jesus, if you look close, you're going to say, like the king said, I find no fault in Him. And when you get close to the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, you're going to say the same thing. I find no fault with this church. It's been washed with the blood of the Lamb. We're not claiming to be perfect. We're claiming to be washed. I'm still on the way. When you look real close, you're going to find he's got mercy. <laughs> For his mercy endureth to all generations. Anybody need mercy? Get close to him. Jesus said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says they all walked away. The woman is still looking down. And Jesus says, where are thine accusers? She looks up. They're all gone, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Are you looking close? There's mercy there. There's healing there. It's time for the church to begin to look at our husband. He's a provider. I was telling my wife, we were poor when we were growing up. There were 10 of us all together. And we worked the fields and we didn't know sometimes where the food was going to come from. But every day we ate, Sister Salazar, every day. I'm almost 70 years old. How many days in a year? 365. Multiply that times 70. I'm not that good. <laughs> I was hoping nobody out here could come up with a number, but that's a lot of days. That's a lot of hours. That's a lot of meals. But my God has provided. I once was young. Now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That's my testimony, and I'm sticking to it. And when I die, I don't know how old I'll be, but as I lay there, Sister Rios, if you're still with me, I told her one time, I said, I hope you go first so you don't have to suffer without me. But God handles all that stuff, right? So if she's there, I hope I can look in her eyes and say, God was faithful, honey. God was faithful. I never forget the time coming here to Immokalee for the first time. And we, we met the church. We met Brother Raymar. And we were getting ready to walk into the church house there on 9th Street. And my wife was confronted by a lady in the church. And she says, do you know how to play the piano? And my wife says, no, ma'am. Taking lessons, but I don't know how to play. Says, well, we don't want you. Just cold. She could have run away right there. So, oh, they offended me. But we had said something a long time ago when we were young. Where he leads, I will follow. God led us here to Immokalee. And I'm thankful for a wife that says, you know what? They can say whatever they want. If God be for us, who can be against us? And God has never left us. Our God is a provider. Not only is He a provider, but He's a faithful God. The best thing that God is ever going to give you is His salvation. Do you deserve to be saved? Do I deserve to be saved? No, we don't. But He loves us. He, we, I, I got a feeling, Sister Sister uh, Flores, that we're the best thing that he's ever created. I just got that feeling. Yeah, he created the angels and they got all this splendor. He created us out of the dirt. But he says, you know what? 
angels were up there and they revolted against me. I gave them all the light. Lucifer had all the light. It looked beautiful. And they revolt against me. But you know what I'm going to do, devil? I'm going to cast you down there where there's dirt. And then I'm going to take dirt from down there where you're at. And I'm going to form a man and a woman. And, and they're going to glorify me. And I'm going to make them blossom. I'm going to make them holy. You want to be holy? You can be holy for Jesus. Amen. We're going to defeat. We are going to defeat evil. I know Maxine Waters... A few months ago, a few years, a couple of years ago, stood up and he said, Do you see any of these kind talking about you and I, conservatives? You see any of this kind? So you you create a crowd. Cowards. You need a crowd to come against Christians, against conservatives. We're not looking for any trouble. We don't have guns. But you, you, she said, form a crowd and you tell them that there is no place here for them. They hate Christians. They hate conservatives. They hate people that has got the concepts and the word of God. Because as long as we are led by the word of God, they cannot lead us. They want to control us. But I, I got news for Maxine Waters. You can persecute me upon this world. But someday our king will come. And you know what he says? I seen it in the word of God it says there will be no place found for them except for in a lake of fire. And I'm not saying Maxine Waters is going to hell, but I'm saying if you don't follow Jesus, you're going to be lost. I'd rather follow Jesus than follow Maxine Waters. I would rather follow Jesus than Joe Biden. I would rather follow Jesus than Kamala Harris. I would rather follow Jesus than Democrats or Republicans. I would rather follow Jesus and his ordinances because, why? Because it's so much fun. I don't know if it's so much fun. We could have a little bit more fun, couldn't we? The world, they turn their music and they begin to dance. And I don't know how to dance. <laughs> I tell my wife, somebody put on, on Facebook, are Pentecostals too emotional? And like, you ain't seen nothing yet, girl. When we get to heaven and the angel begin to play, they ain't not going to be able to sing, but you and I are going to sing a song that the angels cannot sing. I once was lost in sin, and Jesus brought me in. In closing tonight, when you got married, there were some vows that you had to give, right? And what were you supposed to repeat? I do. Not, I'll think about it. I might. I do. The church, let's stand. The church needs to answer the call with I do. Not I just believe, but I do. I want to do what's holy. I want to do what's right. I want to look at my husband, Jesus Christ, and says, Lord, you've got nothing, you've done nothing but good. You've shown mercy. You've given me food. You've given me clothing. There are people every day that get clothing, they get boats, they get cars, they get oxygen out of the air. All this stuff that they have is all made out of the earth that God created. They use it every day. Never once look up and say, Thank you, Jesus. What little I have, what little you have. Let us be thankful. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. I do, Lord. I said I do a long time ago, and I still do. And I will till the day I die. I'll not trade my cross till I put on a crown. And now, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Let us not weary and well-doing, for in due season we are going to reap if we faint not. Let us not walk away, but let us walk the way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Shake hands with somebody. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord.